Well, hello again, and thank you very much for joining me. I'm going to read Love is Enough, which is a poem that was written by William Morris. Morris, as you probably know, was an English textile designer, a poet, a novelist, a translator, and a social activist who was born in 1834 and died in 1896. I'm going to read the poem first, and then I'll say a few words about it afterwards. Love is Enough by William Morris Love is enough, though the world be a waning, and the woods have no voice but the voice of complaining. Though the sky be too dark for dim eyes to discover the gold cups and daisies fair blooming thereunder, though the hills be held shadows and the sea a dark wonder, and this day draw a veil over all deeds passed over, yet their hands shall not tremble, their feet shall not falter, the void shall not weary, the fear shall not alter, these lips and these eyes of the loved and the lover. William Morris wrote that poem in the 1860s, and it doesn't have a clear rhyme scheme. That's actually something that it has in common with writers like Homer uh, and other Greek poets. Its structure is primarily created by the accents on particular words, and that's something we see first used in England in Middle English by writers like William Langland in his poem Piers Plowman. And that's along with Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, one of the greatest poems of the English language. Interesting, there's also an influence of Norse poetry in Love is Enough. And this is something that really fascinated me when I started looking at the written text in detail. I noticed that there's a very strict pattern of alliteration, which you find in Icelandic sagas. Um, this is a little complicated and time-consuming to explain. And it's quite hard to spot. But in the first two lines, if I read them again... Love is enough, though the world be a waning, and the woods have no voice but the voice of complaining. There's a lot of similar sounds in there which give an enormous richness. Anglo-Saxon writers didn't really compose lines in that way. And I can only think that this very powerful, undulating Norse rhythm of alliteration has appeared here because Morris had been immersed in the study of Icelandic literature from the 1860s onwards. I discovered something absolutely fascinating in a book by James Diedrich, which was published in January this year, 2017, and it's called Mathilde Blind, Late Victorian Culture and the Women of Letters, which is a very good read, by the way. He says that on the 25th of May in 1870, William Morris attended a lecture at the Assembly Rooms in St. John's Wood, which was given by Mathilde Blind, who was a gem-born English poet, an essayist and a literary critic. And the subject of the lecture was a translation that Morris had co-written with a man called Erika Magnusson, who was a librarian at Cambridge University and a lecturer in Old Norse. The poem that Morris and Magnusson had translated was called The Volsunga Saga, and Morris had published it in 1870. Apparently, during the lecture that Morris had attended, Mathilde narrated the Volsunga saga so dramatically that it had a marked effect on the highly cultivated audience who warmly applauded. That's a quote from somebody who was there at the time. Mathilde Blind then reviewed Morris's Love is Enough in 1871, calling Morris a genius. She speaks of the poem's mysticism, which includes the weird sweetness of Celtic legends. And she says that this kind of poetry always produces on our imagination an effect somewhat resembling the impression received on looking at a familiar landscape through the mellow and blazonry of a painted casement. It severs what is impure and transient from the lofty and imperishable. Well, that's a spectacular description that any poet would be proud to hear expressed about his work. The English poet Christina Rossetti, who was alive from 1830 to 1894, said around the time that Love Enough was composed, The poem is, I think, a higher point of execution perhaps than anything he has done, having a passionate lyric quality such as one found in his earlier work, and of course much more mature balance in carrying out. And the playwright John Drinkwater, 1882 to 1937, said, There is love poetry that is scarcely to be surpassed in its depth and tenderness. Another beautiful quote. So the poem was printed by Morris's Kelmscott Press in 1897, which unfortunately was a year after Morris's death. 
I'll just say a brief word about the subject of the poem. It's really a morality play. Lovers press ahead through a dark woodland where it's difficult to see the natural beauty around them, but they don't fear and they don't falter. It's about idealized love, but it's also about love for the divine, which is the same sort of love that we see Dante expressing for Beatrice in the Divine Comedy. Morris is describing love as a place to occupy rather than merely a feeling. Love is something that matures the spirit as well as the body. And I think the main theme of the poem is the necessity of expressing kindness in the face of evil, love in the face of hatred, and gentleness in the face of cruelty. If you're a lover, you will be loved, and you will never grow weary or be afraid. Thank you.